On the morning of Wednesday, April 26, 1999, the famous BBC journalist Jill Dando wakes up at her fiancé Alan Farthing's house in Chiswick, West London. The two have been engaged for three months and are said to be married in five. Jill cooks breakfast for Alan, and after he leaves for work around 10 a.m., she takes her car and starts to drive home. Her agent, John Roseman, had just informed her that he had faxed some documents to her. So, before heading out to a charity lunch at a Mayfair hotel, the 37-year-old woman decides to make a stop. Jill stops at a petrol station and then goes shopping at Hammersmith Town Centre, where she buys some paper. At 11.10 a.m., the journalist takes her car and drives on Fulham Road, heading home. At 11.30 a.m., Jill parks right in front of her house at 29 Gowan Avenue. She walks up to the gateway and inserts the key in the lock. This is the last thing Jill will do before being viciously assassinated right in front of her door. At 11.47 a.m., Helen Doble, a TV producer friend and neighbor of Jill, calls the police after finding the journalist's body. When the ambulance arrives 15 minutes later, despite attempts to save her, the BBC phenomenon has succumbed to her injuries and is declared dead later in the afternoon. She had been shot in the head. 25 years later, Jill's murder is still unsolved, and the case seems to be at a dead end. Welcome to Bad Things. As usual, we'll be looking at the timeline, the known facts, and the theories to determine what most likely happened to Jill Dando. Jill Wendy Dando was born in Western Supermare, Somerset, on November 9, 1961. Growing up in a family of journalists, Jill quickly showed a natural talent for her future career. She was an outgoing, friendly little girl with an ease and interest in words. As a teenager, she became a head girl and joined the Western Supermare Amateur Dramatic Society and then the Exeter Theatre Company, performing at the Barnfield Theatre. After completing her A-levels in 1979, Jill followed in her brother's and father's footsteps and began studying journalism at the South Glamorgan Institute of Higher Education. Meanwhile, the young woman volunteered at Sunshine Hospital Radio in Western Supermare, possibly as a tribute to the heart surgery that saved her when she was four and diagnosed with a hole in the heart. After graduating, she started working for the local paper, the Western Mercury, but Jill's talent quickly caught the eye of the BBC. In 1985, at only 24, she became a newsreader for BBC Radio Devon. From regional to national news, Jill's rise was meteoric. For 10 years, she presented the morning, afternoon and 6 o'clock bulletins and hosted the travel programme Holiday. Under the guidance of BBC executive Bob Wheaton, who was also her lover, the bubbling young Somerset rookie transformed into a professional and sophisticated journalist, with the same haircut as Lady Diana. Like the princess, Jill had become one of the nation's most beloved personalities. Her ease in talking to anyone, her contagious laugh and her authenticity helped her grow in popularity, maintaining her girl-next-door image. Two years before her death, Jill was voted BBC Personality of the Year. In 1995, Jill began a new chapter when she started co-hosting Crime Watch, the famous British program that covers unsolved crimes. The show quickly helped solve many cases, including high-profile ones. For instance, in 1993, after Crime Watch broadcast CCTV footage, James Bulger's murderers John Venables and Robert Thompson were identified, leading to their arrest. Unfortunately for Jill, when Crime Watch broadcast an episode about her case on May 18, 1999, a few weeks after her murder, nothing came of it, leaving many mysteries surrounding her death. Jill Dando's murder remains the source of numerous wild theories. This investigation has become the Metropolitan Police's biggest murder case since the Yorkshire Ripper. No one seems to have witnessed the crime, and it is impossible to know how many people could have been involved. From day one, the police had very few clues to understand what happened. In the aftermath of Jill's murder, the police reportedly interviewed more than 2,500 people, 
took over a thousand statements and traced more than 1,200 cars. The police initially focused their investigation on the journalist's close circle, reasoning that since Jill was rarely home, the person who killed her must have known her habits. They quickly abandoned this line of inquiry, finding no plausible motives. On the forensic side, there was little to go on. Unfortunately, the scene had been heavily contaminated when the paramedics tried to resuscitate Jill. However, during a meticulous search, experts found a bullet from a 9mm caliber weapon on the doorstep. The ballistic expert established that it was a single shot, giving the impression the murderer might have been a professional. The bullet also had a unique feature. Its cartridge case had been crimped, which was extremely rare. Additionally, Jill had bruises on her arms, indicating she might have tried to defend herself from her attacker. From a witness perspective, the scant testimonies the police gathered didn't help much. The postman said he saw a Mediterranean-looking man just after 10 a.m. on the opposite side of the road from Jill's house. Jill's next-door neighbor, Richard Hughes, heard a startled scream and a gate clang before going to his window. He then saw a six-foot-tall white man, aged around 40, walking away from the house. Some people in the nearby streets saw a man matching this description, adding that he wore a long, dark coat. Another witness said he saw a sweating and agitated man at a bus stop nearby around the time of the murder. But how can we be sure this man is the same person described in each account and whether he could be linked to the murder? A traffic warden on a nearby street told the police that a few moments after the time of the murder, she was about to issue a ticket to a blue Range Rover. As she began writing it, the driver brushed her off and drove away. Later, the police received similar reports of a blue Range Rover seen speeding across Putney Bridge, heading in the opposite direction of the murder scene. Despite an extensive CCTV search, they were never able to locate or identify the vehicle, nor could they determine if the killer was in it. The only certainty the CCTV search provided was that Jill had not been followed in the hour and a half preceding her death. Under public scrutiny and pressure, the police released an e-fit based on witnesses' testimonies on April 30th, 1999. However, due to Jill's celebrity, the Metropolitan Police faced numerous false leads from people seeking a moment of fame or trying to claim the £250,000 reward. While investigating Jill's life, the investigators turned to her professional life. One of the leads was the Serbian connection. In April 1999, during the Yugoslav Wars, NATO bombed the headquarters of the radio television of Serbia, killing journalists. In retaliation, correspondents were killed, and the BBC feared Jill's death was an act of revenge. The police received numerous anonymous calls claiming Jill had been killed by a Serbian connection. They also investigated threatening letters received by the newsroom where she worked. But could Jill's murder have been committed by an angry individual seeking revenge, or by the Serbian government using an underground network to make a political statement? These two options were deemed unlikely, and the police, working closely with special services, concluded that the Serbian connection was not a serious lead. Later, an informant known as Mr. James linked Jill's murder to the London crime scene. He provided names and claimed they wanted to avenge her work on Crime Watch. However, the police soon realized Mr. James was lying and was trying to implicate rivals in Jill's murder to get rid of them. The crime-mafia connection was also abandoned. For months, the police had no other serious leads, and the investigation was going nowhere. That was until late February 2000. At that time, the investigation team had received numerous phone calls pointing to one man, Barry Balsara. Barry was living a few streets away from Gowan Avenue on Crookham Road. In the days following the murder, different sources recalled the 39-year-old asking them if they could remember how he was dressed on the day of the crime or at what time they saw him that same day, as if he was trying to build an alibi. The police did some background research on Barry, and what they found concerned them. Barry's last name was, in fact, not Balsara, it was George. Barry George had been arrested and convicted for attempted rape and other types of sexual assault during the 1980s. He was known to impersonate famous people and policemen 
to seek attention and attract women, leading to some convictions. Barry even pretended he was part of the IRA. Even more disturbing, on January 10, 1983, George had been found in the grounds of Kensington Palace, where Princess Diana was living at the time. He had been discovered hiding in the grounds, wearing a balaclava, and carrying a poem he had written to Prince Charles. More recently, Barry had gone through a divorce, traumatizing a Japanese student he had married, apparently for convenience. He had taken the name Balsara to pretend he was Freddie Mercury's cousin. The police then decided to put him under surveillance, and once again, Barry fit the type of character you might suspect. Unemployed, completely marginalized, and spending his days wandering around, often approaching and following people, especially women. He seemed to be the loner the police were looking for. The police succeeded in obtaining a search warrant for Barry's place, and once again they found disturbing elements. In the chaotic mess of the flat, investigators recovered a collection of newspapers about female celebrities, some of them about Jill Dando. They found a handwritten list of firearm replicas and part of a gun holster. In the mountains of trash, they also recovered boxes of undeveloped films, which later revealed pictures of Barry's targets in the street and also of him with firearms. Finally, the investigators found a coat similar to the one described in earlier testimonies. Hamish Campbell, the officer in charge of the case, declared Barry the main suspect. On May 25, 2000, Barry was arrested and interrogated for three days. He denied everything, but soon forensic evidence seemed to incriminate him. Gunshot residue was found in one of the pockets of his coat, placing him at the crime scene. On May 28, 2000, Barry George was charged with the murder of Jill Dando. Michael Mansfield, Barry's lawyer, argued that the prosecution's case was too thin and that it was impossible for his client to have killed Jill. During the trial, experts testified that Barry had cognitive impairments and was not capable of being as organized as the killer likely was. Mansfield also emphasized that the only evidence the prosecution had was gunshot residue, which was not reliable. There was no solid forensic evidence linking Barry to the crime scene, and despite his disturbing behavior, Mansfield showed that there was no motive either. Nearly one year later, on May 25, 2001, his trial began at the Old Bailey. Despite a lengthy deliberation, the jury found Barry guilty on July 2, 2001, and sentenced him to life in prison. But Barry continued to claim his innocence, and his sister, Michelle Diskin, did everything she could to help her brother. She contacted Raphael Rowe, an investigative journalist specializing in cases of wrongful convictions. Rowe had also been wrongly convicted of murder and robbery when he was 20 and had spent 12 years in prison. Thanks to his sister, who helped him build a case, he was eventually acquitted and released. When Michelle talked to him about her brother's case, he felt he could help. Rowe's private investigation indeed helped to prove that the only physical evidence linking Barry to the crime scene was unreliable. The gunshot residue was not reliable due to contamination concerns. How could gunshot residue found one year after the murder, in a coat discovered in a messy flat, and not proven to be linked to the crime scene, be seen as strong physical evidence of Barry's presence at the crime scene? In 2007, Barry's appeal was accepted and a retrial was ordered after the original conviction was found to be unsafe. He was finally found not guilty on August 1st, 2008, and released from prison. To this day, Hamish Campbell maintains that Barry George is Jill's murderer and that he got away with it. Meanwhile, no other investigation has been conducted into the BBC journalist's assassination, and the case remains cold. However, there are still certain theories that could help to uncover what most likely happened to Jill Dando. Twenty-five years after Jill's murder, there are still plenty of theories about who killed Jill Dando. While it is impossible to completely dismiss the theory of a stalker or deranged fan, we won't explore these leads as there are no substantial elements to support this idea. A theory often discussed is linked to Jimmy Savile. 
Some speculate that Jill was investigating a paedophile ring connected to the infamous BBC host and was killed before she could expose him. However, the investigative journalist who brought the entire Savile story to light, Mark Williams Thomas, said this theory makes no sense. Recently, Niels Dando, Jill's elder brother, claimed he believes his sister died in a crossfire and that the person who killed her might not have known who she was. His theory could be linked to another one that emerged very recently. In June 2022, Paris court papers suggested that Jill could have been mistaken for another BBC journalist, Lisa Brinkworth. Back in 1998, Lisa was an undercover journalist working on the BBC Donald McIntyre Investigates series. She was posing as a model to expose abuse in the fashion industry. The journalist alleged that she was sexually assaulted while filming by one of the world's biggest model agents, Gérald Marie from Elite Models. After discovering she was a journalist and fearing she would talk, Marie allegedly hired a Russian hitman to deal with her. Flash forward to 2020. Gérald Marie was accused of sexual assault by 11 women and was prosecuted in France. The Paris firm Bourdon and Associates filed legal papers exposing a conversation between Gérald Marie and his connections with the Russian Mafia. They added, shortly thereafter, a BBC journalist, Jill Dando, was shot dead in April 1999. Indeed, these two journalists were in their 30s, were blonde with similar facial features and of the same height and stature. They lived close to each other and had people in common, including Jill Dando's partner. This theory would explain the professional aspect of the murder and the fact that no one claimed responsibility. Of course, Gérald Marie denied it. But as intriguing as this theory is, it is based only on assumptions. There is no proof that Gérald Marie tried to kill Lisa Brinkworth. He had enough power to stop her from talking without resorting to murder. There is also no proof he hired a hitman with Russian Mafia links to do it, and even less evidence that this professional hitman would have mistaken the two women. Due to the nature of the crime, it seems likely that Jill's murderer was a professional, as many experts have emphasized. Not only did the person plan to kill her at a specific time, but they were also skilled enough to not be afraid of killing a woman in broad daylight in a wealthy area of London. Given that Jill parked directly in front of her house, the killer had a very short window to act before she could see them. In this context, the Serbian connection could be plausible. As Mansfield explained during Barry George's trial, the bullet found at the crime scene had a very rare feature, its crimped cartridge. According to some informants, this pointed to a Serbian connection. Jill, being one of the most beloved journalists at the BBC, was the perfect target in a highly political context. Recently, an expert linked a famous Serbian hitman, Milorad Ulemic, to the murder scene. Ulemic, who worked for Slobodan Milosevic, was responsible for eliminating his opponents. Now serving a life sentence in Serbia, he was identified by Emi Palito, a facial recognition expert, in CCTV footage. Ulemic also appears to resemble an e-fit, but there is no certainty. The problem with this theory also lies in the fact that no one claimed responsibility for the murder. Whether it was an individual seeking revenge, a commando unit, or even the Serbian government, it is more likely they would have confirmed their involvement in Jill's assassination to assert themselves. Ulemic never claimed the murder, and there is no proof he was in the UK, let alone in London and near the crime scene when it occurred. We believe the most likely theory is the crime connection. By hosting Crime Watch, Jill exposed herself. As explained earlier, Crime Watch played a role in the arrest of crime figures and assisted the police in solving unsolved cases. Not only was Jill hosting the program, but she was also very vocal about her work. During the investigation, detectives discounted up to 30 people who had resented the BBC programs and its host. Whether it was to avenge someone one of her investigations sent to prison, or because people feared she might expose their business, she might have angered the wrong people. Mark Williams Thomas, whom we mentioned earlier in the Jimmy Savile case, suggested in 2015 
that Jill was killed on the orders of a London underworld lord named Mr. Big. Williams Thomas, a former detective, stated that after digging into the 52,000 documents Barry George's defense had access to, he found an intelligence report naming two London men known for their involvement in major organized crime gangs. Jill's brutal murder, he suggested, would have been a message to other journalists. Do not take on organized crime. If Jill's murderer is linked to a criminal network, it is unlikely that anyone would come forward or claim responsibility. This would also explain why nobody has spoken out since the BBC journalist was killed on her doorstep, fearing retaliation. For instance, in the 2023 Netflix documentary Who Killed Jill Dando, Noel Razor Smith, an ex-criminal turned writer, claims he knows who did it but can't talk or give any clues in order to stay alive. What is concerning about this theory is that we might never know what really happened to Jill. Criminals might privately claim they murdered the journalist, but how can we prove they really did it? How can we be sure they are not lying? The more years that pass, the harder it becomes to find irrefutable proof, leaving little chance of catching the killer. One thing is for sure, the Dando family and the investigators can only hope for crucial testimony that could help reopen the case and lead to the arrest of the murderer. Do you agree with our analysis? Did we miss something? We'd love to hear your views in the comments.